Good afternoon, I'm Kathy Salisbury, the director of the Ambler Arboretum of Temple University. And this first week of May, I was supposed to do a director's walk, a spring flowers and um, seasonal director's walk through the Arboretum. I offer these once a season. They're free and open to the public, whoever would like to attend. And we usually just look at what's interesting around the Arboretum in that season. And because we are still practicing social distancing and we care very much about the safety and the health of our community, we are still closed to the public. But I thought we could still do a spring walk. And uh, so what I'm going to do is take a walk around my backyard and take a look at the um, flowers and plants that are delighting me in my backyard this spring. I don't have nearly d the diversity that the Ambler Arboretum has. Um, but I live in the woodlands and I have some gardens that I've planted. And so I um, will share those with you today. And so we're starting off here with our spring beauty. And spring beauty is a native wildflower. And um, it is really cool. It closes at night and opens back up during the day. It protects its pollen and um, from anything happening to it while the insects are sleeping that would normally pollinate this. So here you can see this um, is a pretty pink uh, shade of spring beauty and they can vary in from deep pink to white and they often have these stripes on them. They're really quite lovely. You can see by the size of the acorn in the background here, the acorn cap, that they're not very big flowers at all. They're tiny, but they colonize and they really create an understory of wildflowers where they're happy and so um, on a sunny day like it is today you can just look through the woods and see all of them blooming and it's really cheerful and it's a great sign of spring this is called claytonia and um, they grow from a tuber actually and the tuber is edible but you want to make sure you positively identify it if you want to try and eat it but also you don't want to eat these plants uh, they provide food for wildlife and nectar and pollen and they help um, stabilize forest floors so you really want to make sure that if you are choosing to eat wild edibles that you do it in a responsible way that so that there's enough left for nature as well so you can hear you see some buds coming out of the spring beauty and if i stand up here we might be able to see all these little white specks throughout the woods or almost as far as you can see, which just thrills me. Um, you can see I am in the woods here, but there's little white specks all over and those are all spring beauties. So you can see they're just sort of tucked in. And with the spring, sorry if I'm making you motion sick here. With the spring beauties uh, in my forest, I also have, um, rue anemone which is another sweet little wild flower you can tell this is rue anemone by its lobed leaves here you can see they grow right with the spring beauty you can see that down in the corner just this nice white flower that kind of flutters in the breeze another native wild flower and also growing in this little area here in addition to the spring beauty are some sedges and so so we have some sedges growing in here which are grass-like plants and uh, really excellent options for the landscape. There's native and non-native sedges, and um, there's a sedge for almost every landscape situation. I think I've mentioned that before. And in here also is some, some moss growing, which I just really like. I love this whole little garden that Mother Nature planted with sedges and spring beauties and ruin enemies and moss is just um, a great example of what you could do if you have a woodland garden. Sometimes you can just go take a walk in the woods someplace and Mother Nature will show you what grows well together. She's a great designer, right? And so here also we have a little May apple coming up. So this is a single leaf May apple, which means it will not, oops, I lost it, will not get a flower this year. Just one leaf means we'll not get a flower. And I did see the deer have been eating my May apples. Um, so I just see stalks around without the little leaves on them. But here's a May apple. And now I'm gonna crunch through the leaves. 
You can see the spring beauties around. I feel so lucky to have all these beautiful wildflowers here. Okay, and we're gonna go, I see a bright pink patch here. Have to show you. I mean, if we're gonna make this like the walks that I give during the director's walks, we must be distracted by shiny, colorful flowers, right? So there's some more spring beauties. Okay, so now we're going to kind of walk through the woods here. Looking at all these lovely spring beauties, just wide open. And here's another combination that I just love that just appears. I didn't do anything in my woods. These just happen here. They're native and they're happy here. But here we have another sedge. So there's another sedge. And then here we have our common blue violets. And common blue violets, you can see what a beautiful combination they make with the spring beauties. So there's some more common blue violets mixed in with the spring beauties. But common blue violets will live in sun or shade and some people consider them a weed. When I um, worked for Penn State Extension as a horticulture educator, I often had people asking me how to get rid of violets in their lawn and in their garden because they considered them a weed. But the fact is they're a native wildflower and they support native butterflies. The fritillary butterflies wouldn't be here without violets. And so we want to keep them around. They are perennial native wildflowers and they're uh, ground cover, right? So they grow low to the ground, but you'll find them in sun or shade here and um, different shades of purple. There's a, a few different species of violets. We're going to look at another one today too that live around here, but they are uh, important in our ecosystem. They spread a few different ways. And so that's why if you think that they're getting around all over your yard, it's probably because they are, because they have adapted many ways to spread throughout your yard. So that's the common blue violet. We're just gonna move through here. I don't know if you can see our, the chickens. These are the lovely ladies, some of the lovely ladies that get to look at the woods and see the flowers bloom. And we're gonna come over here to our Virginia bluebell. So Virginia bluebell, uh, Mertensia virginica, is a, what we call a spring ephemeral. And so these come up in the spring before the leaves are out on the trees. And then, um, and they bloom, they set seed, they photosynthesize, they get all the energy they need. And then um, when the leaves come out on the trees and it starts to get really shaded in the forest, these go dormant and they disappear and they go back under the soil. And so that's why they're called ephemeral. So sometimes there's wildflowers in the woods that if you visit in July or August or September, you have no idea they're even there. And um, that's the case with Virginia bluebells. What I love most about Virginia bluebells, they're perennials, they come back every year, but I just love how the flowers start out as pink buds and then they're kind of darker blue and then open to this really pale blue. I just love the multiple colors that you see on here. And uh, the deer don't seem to bother them too much, at least here. And um, they like kind of lowland wetter areas and slopes uh, down towards streams and rivers. So there's definitely something to consider uh, in your landscape. They're just beautiful. All right. I'm gonna keep walking through the woods here. We're gonna stop at our lesser selen, or I'm sorry, not lesser celandine. This is garlic mustard. This is an invasive plant that you should get to know and pull out where you see it. Uh, this is flowering now, it's a biennial. And so um, that means it will set seed this year. It'll flower and set seed if you see the flowers. And uh, you should, it's, uh, it, it's known for changing the soil pH in an ecosystem, inhibiting other plants from growing around it. 
Also, there's been um, some findings that show it might also inhibit native butterfly uh, development. And so that's a problem too. Not anything eats this or uses it in the landscape. Um, so it's of no benefit and it's out competing our native wildflowers like the Virginia bluebells and the spring beauties and the ruin enemies that we've been looking at. So this is considered an invasive plant. You want to get that out of the ground when you see it. Walk through the garden here. And we're gonna take a shortcut. Get to see my backyard and all its excitement. Okay. So in my garden here, we have um, Jacob's Ladder. This is another perennial plant and um, just really beautiful pale purple flowers that bloom in the spring. Um, some of the earliest native perennials to bloom and uh, they just sort of make bigger and bigger clumps. I really like the leaf shape too. They're compound leaves and they just add a nice different texture into the garden. And all these early flowering plants are really important for pollinators, right? Because on warm days like this one is, it's getting up to 65, 70, it's almost May. On warm days like that, um, these early flowers are super important for bees and for flies and all the other pollinators. Even dandelions. I do not get rid of dandelions in my yard. I am kind of fond of dandelions. They're also great for early spring pollinators. If these were sold in garden centers, people would buy them because they're so ornamental. But instead, they have a bad reputation of being a weed. They were brought over here by colonists as food and medicine. And um, they're really great. Bees love them. They're really great early season pollinators. They do spread their seeds and they do naturalize. They're not considered invasive though. Um, but you can see I've got a few here and some people are probably cringing and saying, why don't you pull those out? Well, I just love those puff balls that you get to make wishes on. And I don't know why I'd pull out any potential wishes. So I keep them around in most places. In some places I do um, remove them from the premises. Another plant I have in my garden here, it's beautiful blooming in the spring, is the wood poppy. And so wood poppy, another native wildflower, you can see just how beautiful it is, shiny yellow. And uh, I really get a kick out of the buds. They're so fuzzy. Look at those fuzzy buds. This one's just starting to open. And so uh, another perennial, these all seed in and fill in a space. This is another plant that deer don't like, which is really nice in this area. And uh, most places have plant cells, native plant cells, you can find these uh, available. And I think they pair up really nicely, the yellow and the purple. So you have the wood poppy and the Jacob's ladder there. And I think that's a really nice combination. So also here we have the, this is Tiarella or uh, foam flower it's called. And the foam flower makes a ground cover. So you can see that there's, uh, in the distance, you can see these spikes of flowers just keep going. And um, I planted them. I would like them to fill in and be a ground cover. This area used to be all entirely Japanese pachysandra. And so I've worked hard to get that pachysandra out and have replaced it with these native spring wildflowers. And so here we have foam flower. And that, the great thing about foam flowers that not only in the spring does it get these really great flowers that have a, a good long display of a couple of weeks, these will bloom and you'll be able to see the flowers, but they also have really interesting leaves. And so you can find foam flowers, uh, Tiarella, with lots of different leaf shapes, patterns, colors, and they're really ornamental even when they're not flowering. But to me, the flower is stunning. I just love this kind of white, creamy white flower with these peach stamens. I just think they're just beautiful and really makes a nice ground cover. 
and helps keep the weeds out. So as these fill in, I'm a big believer in green mulch, so I don't use mulch. I do have the luck of being in the woods, so leaves do fall and help keep um, weeds down. But in here, my plants are also my mulch. So the more thick these grow and the denser the ground cover is, the less weeds I have coming up. Now I do fight myself in that regard by leaving dandelions grow, but you know, we all have our things that we want to do. And over here, we have a couple of two-leaved may apples. So you can see they're, they're much larger, these may apples. And you can see they have two leaves on them, right? Two leaves there. So normally that would have a flower and, a, and eventually a fruit. And if you look here, you can see in between the may apples in the stems there, you can see the buds, right? And yeah, they haven't opened yet. So these will be big white flowers in May, but we know that they'll get flowers and hopefully set fruit because they have these double leaves instead of just the single leaf. We're gonna head up to the front of the house. And here we have, do you remember who this is? Yes, Tiarella, very good. So this is Tiarella. You can see this one's a little different. It uh, has yellow stamens here. So that one's a little different, but behind it, look who this is. This is our friend Jack in the pulpit. So this is uh, the flower in here, and that's the Jack, can you see, inside the pulpit there. And so that's Jack in the pulpit, another native wildflower. And they come in all shades of um, purples and greens. And um, then when they're finished flowering, they get this cluster of bright red fruits. And actually I leave them. And so that's how I ended up with a few jack in the pulpits around. They also have these great stems that have three leaves on them. So, so it's called triphylum, Erisema triphylum, three leaves triphylum. And so that's one of the ways you can identify them. They kind of let like wetter, shady areas, but they're doing okay here in my front, front of my house. Oops, all right. And so we got two plants left on this spring walk. And this one, I'm not sure how I'm gonna do. The shade is here, but we'll try our best. So another ground cover, um, native ground cover that's great is this American ginger. Um, and so you can see here kind of kidney shaped leaves and hairs on the leaves. If you can see that there, hairy leaves. And if you get close, sometimes when you're appreciating flowers, wildflowers especially, you gotta have to get close to them because they're adapted to be popular and showy to the insects that are going to pollinate them they don't really care what we think about them and their flowers are not for us their flowers are for their pollinators so in this case um, ants and beetles pollinate these flowers and so if you look closely here that is a flower and that flower is accessible to insects that walk around on the ground, right? So they are usually hidden by the leaves, so you really have to get down low to see them in person. You have to get down to a beetle level or a, uh, an ant level to see them. But do you see how they're just saying, they're just like waiting for somebody to come and pollinate them. But they are usually under the leaves and quite hidden. Here they are a little more out in the open because I just raked the leaves off of them. So you see there, so, so that is the American ginger. Now, another plant that has a cool flower, and if you're into like Little Shop of Horrors or other strange plants or movies and books and things about strange plants, this might be a plant of interest to you. So this is another ground cover. This is native uh, more to the southeastern portion of the United States. 
This is called Hexastylus, and it likes a similar situation to the American ginger. You can see it has these great mottled leaves, and uh, it's filled in nicely. You can see I really love the Tiarella. It's just all over the place here, and I'm really thankful for that. And so you can, if you look inside and under these leaves, there is a flower there. Do you see this flower here? It's kind of like a giant one of the ginger we just looked at. So I don't know if you can see that there. So if you can see here. That's the flower of the hexastylus. So much larger than um, the flower from the American ginger and more open up to the sky, but just at ground level. So here's another one here. You can see the hexastylus flowers. So how cool is that? They look um, tropical. If anybody's familiar with uh, Rafflesia, the largest flower uh, that exists in the world, it kind of looks like that. But same idea is that it's going to be attractive to the um, insects that are low to the ground to pollinate it. And so here we have, we have some ferns, some more Tiarella, uh, some more Jacob's Ladder. Uh, here we have, oh, some more ginger there. And above that, we have the brand new leaves of oak leaf hydrangea coming out. And this is a, a native shrub, native to the southeastern United States. But I just love how they, they're so fuzzy. These new leaves are so fuzzy when they come out in this silvery white. I just think they're beautiful. So you can watch them coming out. So that is oak leaf hydrangea. And you can see the oak leaf hydrangea gets this exfoliating bark uh, as it ages. So it has some nice ornamental interest besides in the summer when it's flowering. All right, one more plant. Oh, maybe two. We'll take you on two, two more plants. All right, so this plant here These are called ramps, and ramps are also called wild leeks sometimes, but these are a native uh, plant in the onion family, and they're highly prized for their culinary value. They're considered sort of a higher end staple um, in some culinary foods, and um, people really love them, and they love to eat them and uh, harvest them. But what? Thing I'd like you to know is there's some look-alikes that you, so you want to be sure to positively identify these before you eat them because there are some plants that are toxic that look like these but if you do figure out that you have ramps and they are edible what I encourage you to do is if you find a clump like this and here we have a nice size clump it's about the as big around as a basketball maybe and you should so that the bulbs are edible just like onion bulbs are edible and the leaves are edible and what I encourage you to do is eat the leaves and not the bulbs because the bulbs um, will be the plants for next year if you harvest the bulb then that plant disappears now in this clump there's lots of bulbs growing but um, we want this clump to grow and grow and grow I'd much rather have ramps here than the vinca and pachysandra and all the other non-native stuff that's growing in the woods so um, so if you want to eat them you should harvest the leaves and never more than a third of the plant's leaves at any time. Um, more preferably 10%. So for every 10 leaves, you take a leaf and that's what you eat. And that leaves enough for nature and for the plant to reproduce in, in upcoming years. And so you really want to be sustainable in your harvesting. A lot of people uh, locally forage their food because it is sustainable, but you have to make sure even in that harvesting that you're doing it in a sustainable way so that you know what you're eating and that you're leaving enough for the wildlife and for the forest that needs it and for the system that it's a part of, right? So those are ramps. They get white flowers later on in the year. And there's another bunch of ramps. And one last flower. I'm particularly fond of. It's a tiny little flower, but I was so excited to find it here. And, um, oh, I just see there's two. This is very exciting. And so this is another violet. And I know people just are like, really? Another violet? 
but I just love that violets come in different colors. They're not just purple. And also violets are divided up into two types. They have these violets that are low to the ground, like that common blue violet I just showed you. But then there's also violets that are on stems. So you see this has a pretty tall stem here. This is the downy yellow violet. And it's called downy yellow violet because all parts of it are hairy. The, the stem is hairy, the base of the leaf is hairy. If you can see that there. So, um, so this is the downy yellow violet. This is another native, very sweet. I mean, it's small violet, you can see how tiny it is compared to my finger there. And then look, there's another one here, just growing up. So I let all my native plants go to seed. I want them all to reproduce all over the place. I inherited a landscape full of non-native plants like this vinca and pachysandra all over the woods. And I don't want it there, but I also can't pull it all out. And so any native plants that can survive in here I let them go to seed and I let them thrive and I encourage them and I plant more so that hopefully the natives will outnumber the non-natives soon enough and then I'll get even more birds and insects and beauty in my garden throughout the year. So thank you for joining me today on another virtual director's walk for um, being a visitor and a guest in my backyard and uh, for delighting in these spring wildflowers with me. I am very much looking forward to being able to go on a director's walk with all of you in person when we can. And in the meantime, I hope you all stay safe and healthy and exploring nature. And this is Kathy Salisbury, the director of the Ambler Arboretum of Temple University. Cannot wait to see you in the gardens again. Take care.